Today, I'm going to talk about sequence modeling and natural language processing. This is an important topic. First, it's important pedagogically because it marks the transition from stuff you see in any machine learning class applied to language to crazy models that you won't see anywhere else. You can only really apply them to language. Second, it's important historically because these crazy models drove much of the innovation that we saw in natural language processing. Natural language processing needed these crazy models because natural language processing, with its discrete observations and hierarchical structure, really was different from other application areas. Let's take a look at a unique problem in language, part of speech tagging. From a black box perspective, part of speech tagging takes a sentence as input and then assigns tags to each of the words. For example, it is a pronoun, and table is a noun. Part of speech tagging is important. It's often the first unit of analysis that you do before doing more complicated stuff like parsing or figuring out meaning. But what's a part of speech tag? Before we talk about particular sources of sets of part of speech tags, let's talk about it more generally. A part of speech tag describes what a word does, how it functions in the sentence. The first way of dividing part of speech tags is splitting them into open and closed sets. Closed sets are more functional. Things like prepositions and pronouns. You can't just go inventing a new preposition. I put the bag floor of the table. Open classes are a little more flexible and bigger. They're responsible for conveying meaning more than function. These are your nouns and verbs. And Unlike closed class parts of speech, you can invent new nouns. I can be a Googler. I can Google something. I can eat a sandwich chompingly. Now, there are many tag sets out there. They've been developed over time, and if you're working multilingually, my advice would be to pay attention to the universal dependency tag set. We'll talk more about that later when we actually get to parsing. Let's, however, take a brief look at a tag set developed specifically for English. Uh, this is a tag set that you would find in the physical cover of the Jurassic and Martin second edition book. But since nobody has physical books anymore, I'll assume that you're seeing this for the first time. Let's see some examples of open class parts of speech. Nouns are things you can touch. They can be singular or plural. Another example of a noun is a proper noun. In English, these are usually capitalized because somebody gave them this particular name. While boy is a common noun, singular in in, somebody gave this particular boy the name John. And when that name appears in a text, it's a proper noun. Verbs, parts of speech distinguish when and how many people are doing something. A third person singular present tense verb, he eats, tells you that one thing is eating now. But a first person plural verb, we ate, says that multiple people ate in the past. Adverbs modify nouns and adverbs modify verbs. Comparative adjectives tell you that something is redder than something else, but adverbs can tell you that I talked quickly. Continuing on to close parts of speech. Prepositions say where or how a noun or verb does something or exists. Pronouns stand in for nouns, and determiners tell you which or how much of a noun you have. Or they're used to introduce questions. This is not a grammar class, or no. This is neither a grammar nor a syntax class, so it doesn't make sense to memorize the minutiae of a particular tag set but you should get a feel for what some tag set looks like so that when uh, that tag set or another tag set gives you something like determiner adjective noun, you can recognize that this is a determiner followed by an adjective and a noun. This could correspond to something like this Belgian artist. And hopefully you're getting ideas about how this might be useful for things like question answering. Everything from a WH word or a determiner to a noun is likely going to tell you what the question is about, what kind of thing the question is asking. And from that, if you could extract the lexical answer type, you could tell that 
This question is more likely looking for Magritte than it is for Dali. Because Magritte is Belgian, well, Dali comes from the Iberian Peninsula. So how hard is part of speech tagging? Let's assume that we know what the words are. This is easy in English, usually. In English, 11.5 of word types are ambiguous. That doesn't sound like a lot. But don't forget about our good old friend Zipf's Law. The most frequent types are pretty ambiguous, and they appear a lot. Thus, 40% of word tokens are ambiguous, going back to the type token distinction that we talked about at the beginning of the semester. Here are some examples of like and around being ambiguous. Hopefully you can get a sense of how it's tricky. I like candy is a verb. Time flies like an arrow is a preposition. Around can be a preposition, a particle, or an adverb. I bought it at the shop around the corner is a preposition. I never got around to getting a car is a particle. A new Prius costs around $25,000 is an adverb. Before we get to specialized algorithms for doing part of speech tagging, let's try to approach this as a simple old classification problem, starting with stupid baselines and working our way up. Given a word in context, what is its part of speech? If you just predict the most frequent class, a noun tag, that gives you 0.38 accuracy. Are there any morphemes that give us clues about what a part of speech is? Yeah, adjectives often start with un, re, in, adverbs end with ly, and gerunds end in ing. If you use all of these two and three letter prefixes, this gets us up to 0.55 accuracy. So what more can you do to improve the set of features? Hmm, capitalized nouns tend to be proper nouns. If you add that as a feature, uh, that's pretty powerful even by itself. Using only that feature is actually pretty powerful. It helps you get more of the nouns right, which is a big chunk of the tags. Using a big dictionary, in this case one called WordNet, uh, helps quite a bit more. It lists all the possible parts of speech a word can take. Using that as a classifier gets you up to 0.82 accuracy. But this problem really isn't all that hard. The average disagreement among expert human judges for the Penn Tree Bank was only 3.5%. So what's the deal? What's the problem? The problem is we're approaching the problem totally wrong. This problem is not independent. But if you do it as a simple, straightforward classifier, it treats every word label as being independent of every other word. But the part of speech of one word determines the part of speech of the next word. If I begin a sentence with the and ask you what the part of speech of the next word is going to be, you know it's going to be an adjective or a noun. It ain't going to be another determiner or a verb. And that's without knowing even what the next word actually is. You get all of that just from knowing what the part of speech of the first word in the sentence is. Chinese is a good example of how you can sometimes logic parts of speech out even if you don't know much about the language. Let's take the sentence. Jiu choco, sure water. Chinese often has the same word order as English. And it does in this sentence here. So if I tell you that water is a possessive pronoun, and further that go is a noun, you could think, hmm, the sentence needs to have a verb somewhere, so it's probably going to be between the noun and the pronoun. If you have a noun phrase at the beginning of a sentence, then a likely way to make that happen is a determiner and an adjective. Although it could have been two adjectives, but this is a little bit more likely. And this is all without knowing what any of the words mean. I just told you two parts of the speech and you could logic the rest out. But a classification algorithm can't do this. So what do we need if we want our classification algorithms to do something like this? We need to somehow be smarter. If we want our algorithms to do the same kind of inference, it can't be independent classification. So how does this work? In 2021, there are five general categories of approaches that I think are worth knowing about. Hidden Markov models are old, but theoretically beautiful. 
They have deep connections to automata theory, and they have a beautiful statistical property. They're generative. That means that they don't just give you the probability of a set of tags given an input sentence, they also give you the probability of the underlying sentence itself. When you don't have a lot of training data, this can be very useful and give you relatively high accuracy, unlike neural models, which are pretty data hungry. Slightly more recent models are conditional random fields and the structured perceptron. These are mathematically much like logistic regression for sequence problems. You define features and optimize the probability of the correct part of speech token, where the probability is a function of the dot product of a weight vector and a feature vector extracted from the underlying tag set and the input sentence. For each of these three older models, the hidden Markov model, conditional random fields, and the structured perceptron, you need an algorithm to search through all the possible tag sequences efficiently. It's a beautiful dynamic programming algorithm, and this is why I still teach these algorithms in my graduate classes, because this way of thinking, even if you're not using specifically these models, is useful for understanding other computational problems that you'll likely run into when you're dealing with language. However, the more modern approaches use neural models, and I teach these in my undergraduate classes. Explicitly sequence-based models or transformer-based models. The sequence-based neural models have names like recurrent neural network or long short-term memory model. The transformer-based models are mostly named after Muppets, for reasons you can find out in uh, some of our later videos. I teach them not because they're elegant or beautiful, but because they work well and they're now the gold standard. That said, just like logistic regression is a good sanity check for classification, so are conditional random fields and the structured perceptron. You should compare against them if you can. Before I wrap up, I want to make sure that the beauty and flexibility of these models hasn't been swallowed up by the technical details. While I motivated this with part of speech tagging, there are lots of other things you can apply these sorts of models to. For instance, finding named entities. We have tags to mark where a particular kind of entity begins, B, and continues, I for inside. Or other things we're not interested, the tag O, which stands for outside. Or, as we'll see later, this looks a lot like finding answers to questions. Given a piece of evidence and a question, mark where the answer span is. Sequence models are the sine qua non of natural language processing, and it took a while for us to get here in our study of natural language processing algorithms, but kudos to you for sticking with it. When you see what these models can do, I think you'll agree that it was worth it. It's not just about finding out the hardest speech of a particular word in a sentence, it's also about doing things like, say, generating text in a language model which we'll find out about soon as we move on to new models. If you want to see more videos like this, check the video description for the course that comes from the link down below. You can then see the context and the correct order for watching these videos. YouTube will gleefully show you stuff in the wrong order. If you want other people to see this video, provide a big gradient to the recommendation algorithm by clicking the like and subscribe button down below.